Thank you for joining Upper Room Northwest Online. We hope you're encouraged by the message. If you'd like to partner with us financially, there is a link below this video. Again, thank you so much and have a blessed day. Easter Sunday is the best time to speak because you don't really have to think about what you're going to preach on. It's basically Jesus on the cross, Jesus in the grave, Jesus in the sky. And the unique thing that's different than any other religion um, is that uh, our leader uh, died and came back to life. Can I get an amen? And when I was thinking about this uh, message, I even heard uh, someone speak recently about how it's funny how sometimes pastors and people on Easter put all this pressure on themselves that if they could just say the right words, if they could just give the right message, then they could convince the people that only go to church twice a year on Easter and on Christmas to come more often. Um, and I was thinking about that, and uh, I don't feel any pressure to do that because uh, it's not about that. That's not my heart. Um, I don't think I'm the person to convince you to go to church. But I'll tell you what I do love to do. I love to talk about this man named Jesus. And I love to just invite the Holy Spirit to speak to all of us, to reveal love, a love that maybe we've never felt before. And that's what we're going to do today. Because that's what Easter is all about. It's about love. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can I get an amen? See, Jesus paid a debt that we couldn't pay. We are all guilty, and instead of receiving the punishment that we deserve, Jesus took our place and made a way. Why? Because he loves all of us so much, and he wants a relationship with us. And that can only happen through the blood of Jesus. And although an earthly judge might say that is not allowed for someone who's innocent to take your place, we serve a righteous and just God who says that's exactly how I set it up, that the innocence of Christ would take the place of the guilty. And so we're going to read the Bible today. Luke 24 verse 1 says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Can I get an amen? While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Let's go ahead and pause there. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Have you ever gone looking for Jesus in all the wrong places? This is why it's so important that Upper Room Northwest, our main focus and goal has to be Jesus. Our number one goal cannot be just to grow in numbers. It, that can be the byproduct of our number one goal, which is Jesus. Because if we just try to collect people, then we're creating a tomb. And people will come looking for the living among the dead. We need to be a place that gives Jesus the relationship of Christ to people that need him. I don't care if you go to a different church or you don't go to church. My main goal is to introduce Jesus to people. Jesus will speak to your heart. Now, it's good to go to church. I'm not going to say it's, it's wrong or bad. But Jesus is who we need. Jesus will convince us where we need to go, what we need to do. He said, he's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. That's a good word right there. How many here need to just remember his words over our life? How many here 
find it easy sometimes to forget the promises over our life. And Jesus wants you to remember his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the stripes of linen laying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. And we're going to continue reading on this next story. There's certain places in the Bible where you read, whether it could be G- the way Jesus healed someone or the way Jesus said a parable and you, or a story, and you think, this has to be evidence that this is not made up because nobody would put that in the Bible if it wasn't true. Like, this has to be, this has to be real. And so this next story kind of reminds me of that. It's, it's the road to Emmaus. It says in verse 13, Now that same day, same day that Jesus came back from the grave, that same day two of them were going to the village called uh, Emmaus. Now two of them, that's one, two of his followers. And seven miles from Jerusalem, they were talking with each other about everything that happens. They're talking about Jesus on the cross. They're talking about what happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Let's pause right there. I want you to see this because this is so awesome. Out of all the places Jesus could have first went, out of all the people he could have visited, he visits these two guys that are that we don't even know one of the guy's names. We don't even know who he is. And yet he chooses to go... I mean, if it was me, and I came back from the grave, I mean, I might go talk to Pontius Pilate. I might wake up some of the people that plotted to kill me. Maybe I'd wake them up in the middle of the night when they're sleeping, just like kind of stare over their beds and wait, like wiggle their toes. They'd open their eyes and I'd go, I'm back. You know, I, that's my weird sense of humor. I think that would be awesome. <laughs> I'd make the whole day of it. You know, just start visiting people. But I love this about Jesus. He goes to these two followers. And what do you suppose Jesus says to these guys? Does he say, sup brothers, give me a high five and show the holes in his hands? That's what I would do. But instead he says this. He asks them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? I'll give you a hint here. If Jesus ever asks you a question, he's not looking for information. Jesus already knows what they're talking about. But he's, he's, he's going along. He says, they stood still, their faces downcast. Now remember, Jesus is not revealing himself. He's hiding himself from them. One of them named uh, Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Again, he's talking to Jesus. Out of everybody in Jerusalem, Jesus would be the one who knows what is, they're talking about, what's happened, because it happened to him. <laughs> And Jesus says this, what things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers headed him uh, over, handed him over to the sentence to be, to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning and didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of the uh, companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are. That's Jesus' response. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter to enter his glory? Then enter his glory and begin with Moses and all the pro- sorry, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So Jesus himself, who easily could have revealed himself in that moment, could have easily just showed them. 
He could have easily, like, again, if it was me, I would have just started flying around like Superman and been like, I'm, it's me. But, but Jesus himself is, is using Scripture to reveal himself to them. When he was at the table, uh, sorry, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they argued, uh, they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. So Jesus pretends like he's going somewhere else. And like he's continuing on this journey to the next town. And they're like, no, 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 you should stay with us. You should come, and it's late anyway, so you should come. And he's like, yeah, I don't know, I got places to go. I don't know, he's just like, but he's like, oh, okay, you've convinced me. That's interesting, isn't it? It says in verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and then he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he, was talk, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up, returned at once to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven. And those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. What a crazy story. What a wild story. That's straight out of a movie, right? That's crazy. I remember it brought me back to something that I did um, years ago. Um, I was at a, um, I was at a, uh, it was a parade, a kid's parade. There was hundreds of families, hundreds of kids there. And the person next to me with his kid was someone that I went to high school with, just randomly. Haven't seen him in 15, 20 years, right? And so uh, he didn't recognize me. I didn't have a beard back then. I looked completely different. How many know you don't look the same after 20 years of life? And so, but I recognized him. And he came up to me. And he's like, he didn't recognize me. And he's like, um, man, this is crazy, huh? Look at all these kids, man. It's wow, look at that. He just started talking to me. So I thought I'd use that opportunity to play with him. And so he's a Christian. And I said, you know, this may sound really strange to you that I really feel like you have a music calling on your life. And I knew that he played an instrument. And I went on. And he was like, oh, and then I felt bad. Because he was like, I was like, oh my goodness. And then I said at the end, I said, and I feel like when you were younger in high school, you used to know a friend named Matt Farrell. And then it snapped. He goes, you jerk, how dare you? Like he was like totally caught off guard. And I was, it brought back to me that story because I could think, how did Jesus keep his poker face? Like, how did he stay a straight face when he's talking to these guys? And he's just smart. He knows these guys, right? And he's, he's hid himself. Why would he do that? Why would Jesus hide himself? Why would he continue to keep walking when he knew he wanted to go break bread with these guys? Why did he call these guys slow, a, a fool's? It was almost like Jesus was giving them every reason to write him off or be offended. Jesus often would say things that gave people a reason to say, well, that was weird or that was crazy. Like, this is straight Bible. He said, hate your father, hate your mother, hate your kids, hate your sister, your brother, hate your wife, hate yourself, your own life, or don't even bother following me. He called a woman a dog. He'd say things to people like, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. He would say these parables on big days with lots of visitors, uh, like an Easter event, lots of people visiting. He would say these parables that make no sense, whereas pastors on Easter especially, they try to say things in different ways to communicate very clearly what the word is saying. And Jesus would say these parables that don't make any sense. And often the disciples would go to him and say, what in the world was that about? And they did that in Luke. And he said, the knowledge of the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others I speak in parables so that though seeing they may not see. And though hearing they may not understand. Can you imagine 
if I came up here on Easter and I just told you something that you didn't hear, couldn't understand, that didn't make sense, and you could not see or anything, and you all left, but maybe a couple of you came up and say, what did you mean by that? Jesus would offend people. People would be offended all the time. He would do miracles that didn't make any sense to us in the natural mind. Jesus often would offend the mind to reveal the heart. And I truly believe that if these guys didn't run after Jesus and say, no, no, it's, it's late, you need to come to our house, you know, just you know, come with us, you know, he would have just kept on walking. Why? He's looking for those that will search for him. He's looking for those that are hungry for him. He's looking for those like people like the disciples who'd go to him later and say, what does that mean? What does that mean, Jesus? He's looking for those that are hungry and thirsty and they'll go and run after Jesus no matter the cost, no matter when our natural mind, it doesn't make sense. But the Bible says that we're not supposed to focus on what is seen, but focus on what is unseen because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Notice these guys said, were not our hearts burning within us while, we, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? See, their hearts were already burning with the scripture. Their, the eyes of their hearts were being enlightened, being opened before even their natural eyes were opened. And when they broke bread with Jesus and Jesus revealed to their natural eyes that it was him, he disappears. Why? Because he accomplished what he went there to do. It was to open the eyes of their hearts. And even after he disappeared right before them and appeared, their number one discussion was not, did you see him? He was there and then he disappeared. Their number one discussion was, did our hearts not burn when he spoke to us the scripture? Are you searching with your eyes? Are you using the eyes of your heart? Are you running and are you hungry no matter the cost? The Bible says that those that seek him will find him. But you have to seek him with all your heart. And because he shed his blood and came back to life, he's made a way. He's given us access to break bread, to fellowship and commune with him. He's looking for those that are hungry. He's looking for those that are thirsty. He's looking for those that will run after him and invite him into their house. Invite them to break bread. Invite him to break bread. Would you stand? I'm going to invite Manessa. The more you research and study the kingdom of God, the more, the more I find it's, it's, it's so tempting to be offended in the natural with our mind. Why would he do it that way? Why would he say that? He wants the hungry. He wants the thirsty. He wants the unoffendable. He wants those that will run after him and say, I don't care. If you called me a dog, I want you. I don't care if what you say doesn't make sense to my natural mind and my natural eyes. I want you. I need you. Before we close today's message, I wanted to give everybody in this room and everybody watching online an opportunity to give your heart fully to Jesus. With every eye closed, I just want, we could actually say this prayer together. I believe there are people that are hearing this message that have been feeling the burning in your heart moment. And Jesus is coming alive to you. He's coming and becoming more real to the eyes of your heart. This isn't about getting people to come to church more often. 
My heart is that you would truly know this man and that he would burn in you and that you would go beyond the mind choosing not to be offended to run after this man and say, I need all of you. My prayer is that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, that you know the hope of your calling, the riches of the glorious inheritance and the saints. So let's all just repeat together, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Forgive me of all my sins. I accept you into my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. It doesn't have to be a complicated prayer. It can just be Jesus, help, forgive me. He's so good. He's so worthy. And for those that are watching online, if that's the first time that you prayed that, you're a new creation.